It's our pleasure to welcome you to Beyond Boundaries, a series of virtual sessions initiated by Takshila Educational Society to propagate diverse themes, thoughts, and perspectives. In order to facilitate better understanding of our world and its concerns, we bring articulate speakers from all walks of life on this platform to further ideas that foster learning, self-expression, and ingenuity. In today's session, Finding Your Fire in Your Belly, our speaker, Sanjana, emphasizes the need for seeking one's element and fueling it with lifelong passion. Sanjana Kapoor is a prominent theater entrepreneur and actress. She built Prithvi Theater into one of India's premier cultural hubs and co-founded Junoon Theatres to create a platform for a plethora of art engagements in the country. A recipient of the French honor, Knight of the Order of the Arts and Letters, she has acted in several films and hosted the unique Amul India show on television. Inish initiated the India Theatre Forum as well as the SMART program for theatre practitioners. Sanjana continues the legacy of her paternal and maternal families, the Kapoors and the Kendals, by bringing the richness of theatre into people's lives in multiple ways. The theater, this speaker would now converse for about 30 minutes on the topic. You may submit questions through the chat box of your YouTube channel. All questions from the viewers would be answered collectively by the speaker in the last 15 minutes of the session. Let us begin now. Over to our speaker, Sanjana Kapoor. Thank you. Thank you, Setika. So I shall begin. And this is really difficult because I'm talking to a computer and not to a beautiful live audience of people whose energy I can feed off and get inspired by and get egged on by. So I'm just gonna have to use my imagination and hope that you're all there. Um, and that's what live theater is all about. Uh, the beauty and the joy and the excitement of live theater is the fact that there is this amazing audience in the darkness, uh, huddled up next to each other, always in chairs which are ever so slightly uncomfortable. Uh, a good theater will never really have chairs that you can lounge back in, like in a cinema and eat your popcorn. Chairs in a good theater will always be ever so slightly um, uncomfortable and will urge you to lean forward and to listen and pay attention because the main difference between cinema and theater is that theater can never show you every single bit that the director needs you to see. In cinema, the director can zoom in to a particular aspect uh, or can play music in the background or can have special effects that can give you the emotions and the ideas that the director wants you to have. But in theater, the director can only create a semblance of it and the rest of the work you need to do, which is the beauty of theater because it engages you and forces you to participate and forces you to bring your worldview and your life's experiences and your emotional self into the space to make meaning of it all. And that's what I love about theater. But I'm not gonna talk actually so much about theater today. Today, we're gonna to talk about finding your passion um, from my own experience. Uh, and I'm really, 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 really lucky. I'm lucky that I was born into this incredible family um, that my story really begins with my grandparents. Um, both of which were wonderful, brave, courageous adventurers who went after what was their fire in their belly. And it was clearly to do with acting. It had to do with performance. It had to do with finding your audience and living a life that brought that passion uh, to you and allowed you to enable it and to see it come alive. Um, if you can, Think back to 1944, India. You can imagine what was going on. It was pre-independence. 
It was a time of huge churning. Uh, it was also a time of huge churning in the world. Uh, I mean, the, the Second World War was still in the air. Um, my British grandfather, Jeffrey Kendall, came to India uh, and fell in love. He came to India because he believed that he didn't really want to pick up a gun and take another person's life as part of his duty to his country. So during the Second World War, he joined something called ENSA, which meant that he could walk the floorboards uh, of a stage and perform for the troops across the world. And that was his duty to his country, where he would bring joy and emotion and ideas to troops all over the world who were there to protect his land and his country, but he would do it through his art and his passion. And that brought him to India. And when he came to India, he fell in love with this land, this land full of smells and color and culture and where every 20 kilometers there was a new language and a new food and a new dress. And this was the world he wanted to immerse himself in. And he was lucky enough to have found a wonderful wife who believed the same thing he believed. And he made this his life, traveling across the length and breadth of India and Southeast Asia, taking theater to the most amazing audiences that he had ever experienced. Audiences that were discerning, that knew what theater needed to be and would be completely present when they were in the theater. And around the same time, there was my Indian grandfather, Prithviraj Kapoor, who was at the height of his film career. He was a really well-known film star at that time, being one of the, perhaps, one of the few, or perhaps only one, I'm not sure, but one of the few actors who made it across from silent cinema, black and white, to the talkies, to color, and existed in all those various avatars of the transforming world of cinema. But his true passion was theater. And in 1944, he decided that the only way that he could really reach out to his audiences was not through cinema, but was through theater. And he set up Prithvi Theatres, his theater company. And Zora Segel, some years later, asked him, his leading actress, one of his leading actresses, um, and she said to him, she said, why Prithvi Theatres with an S at the end of it? And he said, well, he wished that there would be many, 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 many Prithvi Theatres born all over the country, not only this one. Um, Unfortunately, that never quite came to be, but it did give birth to, many years later, the building, Prithvi Theater, which I was fortunate enough to be involved with. But what he did was he took theater that he believed in, that talked about issues and concerns that fired him, that needed to be addressed in the burgeoning new country that was going to be. And, and uh, so he talked about farmers, he talked about the role of money in our lives. He talked about the role of art in the new India. He talked about what the preempted the partition and said, this is a terrible, terrible thing and we should avoid this separation of our country. Um, he talked about uh, what it was to be uh, a, a patriot and what it, what it meant to belong to a nation. Um, and he as well traveled the length and breadth of India with his theater company very, very different styles of theater, Shakespeareana, 14 member, 15 member theater group, very small, uh, traveled at the back of trucks. So uh, one of my favorite photographs, which I, which I will show you at some point if I can manage to, or I will, I will share later on this video, um, is, is, is a truck, a photograph of a truck, of a back of a truck piled up with trunks and obviously sets and costumes of Shakespeareana, as well as the company sitting there. My mother's there. My mother was 13 when she came to India for the first time and sitting there with her legs spread out, trying to squeeze onto the trunks, my grandfather and, and the other members of the group. 
immaculately dressed, dressed beautifully. They didn't look like crazy hippies, um, vagabonds. They looked like people who were well-dressed and going on their work, going about their work, but their daily work, which was about sitting in the back of a truck and traveling across this magnificent country of ours, taking what they love most to their audiences. And on the other hand, you had Prithvi theaters. Oh, about 100, 130 people in the company. Three bogies, train bogies would be hired and they would go third class, uh, all of them together with their cooks and their tailors and everybody traveling together. Um, performing in Hindustani. Uh, and then, of course, luck, as luck would have it, these two companies met. And that's how my parents met, lucky for me. And, and they got married, of course. But what was really interesting for me growing up in this family was the stories I heard, uh, the stories of their adventures, of getting caught in floods in the Northeast and losing everything, everything got flooded. Their truck actually got washed away in the flood and luckily the driver survived. But then how they had to start from scratch all over again with nothing. Um, about about uh, amazing audiences at, in schools where there was no stage, but they would tie tables together and make a stage. and because they were such well-trained actors, they had voices that could project and they could actually still convey the magic of Shakespeare to school children in a theater that wasn't a theater at all. It was just a large hall. Um, and yet they would have magic uh, conveyed. And, and, and so this, I grew up never hearing the traditional stories or fairy tales. I grew up listening to these stories and I got, I grew up also listening to their squabbles and their, you know, internal adventures. My grandmother wanted my aunt, who was eight months old when she came to India, Felicity Kendall. And today she's a very well-known actress in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and she, my grandmother wanted her to go to school, uh, but they were a traveling theater company. So it was difficult, you know, you had to keep moving around, but she was insistent. And my grandfather really fought her about this and said, she, we can teach her how to read and write and we can teach her, you know, basic numbers and mathematics and theater will teach her everything else. Theater will teach her about life, the plays we deal with, the ideas we deal with. They will make her understand things about geography, about people, about ideas. What more does she need? My grandmother won that battle. And my aunt did end up going to about, I don't know how many schools, maybe 42 schools, where she had her little trunk of her uniforms. And that was her little trunk of costumes and the roles she would play, where she would dress up in different uniforms and go to schools as they traveled across the country. Because they would travel and then stay for about three weeks or one month in different parts of the country and return again and again and again. So she would go back to the schools. The schools were generous enough in those days to allow her to come back again and again. And she's a fabulously educated woman. My mother, who was 12 years older than her, and at the age of 13, my, she was studying in England and my grandfather went to her headmistress in school and said, uh, I need to take Jennifer out of school for a year. Uh, will you keep her place? I'll bring her back. And the principal said, what? Wow, why? What are you doing? And, and he said, well, we have to go to India and we're going for a year, but we have to take her with us. We can't leave her alone. And the principal said, what better education than that? Of course, take her and we'll keep her place. No problem at all. What an experience to travel. They did take my mother out of school. She came to India for a year. She never went back. She never went back to school. Again, my mother is one of the most educated people I have ever known because life educated her. So I grew up with these very strange views on education, or these not strange, but unusual views on education. And um, we, we went to a wonderful school that allowed us to be who we were, allowed us to be ourselves, our individual selves. And they didn't want to have us fix into any box. It was a Bombay International School in Bombay. And I've always been fascinated with education. And so for one of my great ins 
inspirations has been reading Ken Robinson, who is an amazing educator. And he talks about finding your element, finding your passion. And it's so important. Actually, that's what education should be. Our school education, our, our, our formal education systems should be about allowing you to find your passion, not necessarily about making you a doctor or a scientist or an engineer. And today, especially, these are not necessarily the jobs that are going to be out there for you. In fact, there is no way that we can imagine, we can sit here today and imagine what in 10 years the jobs will be. Because who would have thought 10 years ago or 20 years ago that being a, a chef would be one of the most reputable jobs or being a, a software engineer would be the most incredible job. But being creative, being courageous, being somebody who can think on your feet and imagine somebody who is curious and who can ask the right questions. This is what education should do and allow you to find what you love, not only what you're good at. You know, you might be really, really good at mathematics, but it may not be a great passion for you, but maybe it could lead to something. Maybe you love puzzles. Uh, and 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 or or maybe you love football, something completely different. But the idea is to really, really find what you're passionate about. And then what you have a natural, of course, that you had a natural ability to. So I was always passionate about when I was little, I wanted to learn how to work with my hands in clay and I wanted to make pottery. And I realized my mother never really found me a teacher. She never sent me to pottery class. And I wish she had. But many years later, when I worked in the blind school in Bombay, uh, I did theater there. And, and the children taught me on their wheel how to throw clay. And I very soon realized that I just couldn't center this. I was no good at centering it. I was always wonky donkey. And my pots would always come out very, very odd shaped, which was good because they always recognized them, of course, all the blind kids in the school. But I love that feeling and that sensation. But I knew that was not for me. That was not my calling. I always wanted to be in the wild. I always, always, for me, being out in nature, being one with nature was really important. It was a gift my parents gave me. I think the greatest gift ever was to give us a home in Goa. And from the age of three, I grew up in Goa. I was our second home, you know, three to four months a year I would spend there. And to be able to be on the beach and in the sea. And my father taught me very, very early on how to respect the sea and never, never, never go beyond where I could walk uh, in the ocean, uh, to have deep, deep regard for it, the power of it, the beauty of it. Um, but I never went to a jungle. I really, really wanted to go to a jungle. When I was 10, I was invited to go with my, my closest friends to a jungle and they were boys. My closest friends were boys in those days. I always had boys, boy friends. And my father thought, no, 10 days uh, staying in a room with boys, maybe that's not really right. And didn't allow me to go. And I never forgave him. But as luck would have it, I ended up marrying one of our greatest tiger conservationists, um, Balmik Thapar. And today, my greatest... Sukoon I get is when I am able to go out into the wild, whether it is into the jungles or it is in Africa or it is in the ocean in Maldives. To be one with nature is really, really important. So I'm really glad that that stayed with me. What Ken Robinson talks about is that to find your element is, is difficult and you really need to be lucky as well. You need to have the ability to... to to sense it, to go after it. Your environment needs to nurture it. But then once you've found it, you need to find your tribe. You need to find other people who are out there. Maybe they're even countries away, wherever they are, or they're around you. Find your tribe and hold them close to you. And then be open to chance. You have to be open to good fortune coming your way. Uh, and there are really experiments that have shown, there are experiments that psycho psychologists have done where it shows groups of people who have been closed and not open to good chance coming their way. And there have been the others who've allowed good fortune to come their way and, and what a difference it makes. 
so for me as well, even though I would give the example of, of wildlife and it was only much later on in my life that I went into the jungle for the first time when I was in my late 20s um, and how that transformed my life completely and how I loved it. But keeping it close to you and, 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 and making sure that you nurture yourself with it is really, really important. Um, and never letting go of it, no matter where your life takes you, to be able to actually live your life and earn your living with your passion in your element is truly lucky. And I'm really, really lucky that I am able to, to do theater the way I do. I'm not an actress anymore. I stopped being an actress a long time ago because I realized that what I really, really love, what I also really love, I love acting on stage, but what I really, really also love is to be able to imagine how to bring audiences and theater people together and to let that magic happen in different ways and different forms. And of course the arts as well, because theater is not, it's not just one art, right? It's the word, it's poetry, it's sensorial, so it's music, it's ideas. So you have to have to be somebody who is curious about the world around you and that will go out and find out more about the context of the play you're working with. And it's about opening up yourself to huge empathy because you might be creating a play about characters you don't really know or you don't really feel for. You might be acting as a character that you don't really like, but you're gonna have to find that empathetic part in you that allows you to connect and bring truth to the character, to allow that authentic moment to happen on stage. And that's what theater is all about. It's about the truth. It's about authenticity, about being real, even though it's all make-believe. And that's why I completely love it. I truly do. I'm going to show you, if I can, yes, I can. I'm going to show you three photographs of mine, which are my favorite photographs in the whole wide world. Um, now, where are they? Oh my God. Oh dear, I'm not sure I, I'm able to find them. Okay, maybe I will, I, will, I will have to struggle to finding them, so I maybe won't do that right now. But Ken Robinson talks about something else, which is talked about a lot in education today. He talks about creativity and it's a new buzzword. We're all being asked to be creative. Schools are being asked to be creative and they don't quite know what to do. Uh, in, in your offices and in your workspaces, you're being asked to be creative. Uh, and I just, what does this mean? What does this word mean? Um, and he, Ken Robinson, actually explains it so beautifully. He says to be creative, creativity is actually, uh, it's a process towards coming up with a new idea, a new idea to you. Somebody else may also have thought of it, that doesn't matter, but it's a new idea to you, which is of some value to other people. And that is what creativity is. So it doesn't mean you have to be an artist. It doesn't mean you have to be able to draw beautifully or sing beautifully, but it's about coming up with a new idea. And I think that's what schools really need to be able to nurture for us. And as you are all now going to go off into the universe and go into college and seek what is your path, I hope you can hold creativity close to you. You can find your element and be brave. You have to have courage. You have to have courage to face failure. The other buzzword that I am really disturbed about that is out there today is success. Everybody makes such a big deal about success. And I really think, I, I can't understand this word because why is it so important? Why is to be successful, what does it mean? And stop and think about it for yourself. What does it mean for you? Because it might mean something for you, which is quite different from what it means to the rest of the world. And if you think of what does success mean for you? 
if you were to look at yourself and say, okay, I am successful, what would it be? What would I be? And then let's see if I was successful to the world around me, to my family, to my school, to my society, what would it be? What would it mean? And I'm not sure that it really matters. I think to have impact, to have some, to be of some consequence, maybe that's important. Then you can have consequence to your best friend. You can have consequence to your pet at home. You can have impact in a hundred different ways. And I think that's really, really important for us to find that rather than go after this word success. For me, it's a very problematic word. And, and, and a lot of these things are things that I've been churning in me because I've been, I have a, I have a now he's about to be 18, I have a son. And, you know, a lot of times when I work with, with children or I work with theater and teachers and schools, these are questions that come up. And I really hope that my son can find his passion. And he has, he has, he's found his passion, which is completely different and unimaginable for me. It's different from my passion. It's different from my husband's passion, his passion. And I cannot even begin to really get it, but I am empathetic towards it at some level, I presume, I hope, I, 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 I really do hope I am. His passion is cars. And he is hugely passionate about cars, about supercars, about cars, about actually the whole journalistic aspect of being able to talk about cars and take it out there to a larger public. And this is what drives him. And interestingly enough, it has helped him in mathematics because he understood what ratios were, even though he hates maths, but he could get understand what ratios and, and probability was because of the races he looks he, he follows. And, and it worked with geography because uh, he knew of tiny little countries in the middle of uh, Europe that no other child really knew about and he knew all the flags because of his madness and his and his fervor for racing matches and races all over the world. Um, so it's interesting how your passion can actually lead you to a broader world uh, which need not be just closed in and your parents need not worry that oh my god we're going to lose our child to theater or to cinema or to or to photography or to music or, but maybe your child will actually be a more whole human being um, for me culture is really important too and there is a beautiful thing I found, and I'm going to read it to you. Um, and I've chanced upon this on the internet. Can you imagine? It's 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 an anonymous manifesto um, on 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 culture. And it says, collective means of who we are, what we are doing here and why. Our culture reflects us, how we see the world and how the world sees us. Isn't that beautiful? This is like my little anthem. I love it. And so much of this has to do with identity. And it's really important for us to know who we are, especially in India, which is just so diverse and so wonderful. And we need to enrich this. We need to celebrate this. We need to celebrate this diversity and say, this is who we belong. You know, most. European countries are monocultural. They have one way of dressing or one language or one way of eating. Whereas here in this country of ours, it is just so amazing the variety we have. And that's what we should be holding up 
as our flag to the world. And I'm going to leave you, before we start questions, with a little passage that my grandfather wrote. This is Jeffrey Kendall. So he's my real hero, my absolute hero, my maternal grandfather. And this is the book he wrote. And in it, he writes about being an actor must be the best job in the world. It combines all the things that a person need look for. Health romance, travel, the fun of the lottery, the positive tragedy of failure, and the will to overcome it. It provides good companionship and interest in literature, architecture, music, and dancing. In short, just about everything that most people strive for. But the theater is female. And like all females, she will not be trifled with. She must be grasped with both hands and given one's whole self, body and soul, if she is to be a proper mate. She must not be dallied with or neglected or flirted with or she will bite and that bite will never heal. This may sound over dramatic, but it is true and may be seen over and over again. That's why I love theater. Before we go to the questions, I'm going to uh, also tell you that I'm going to share some, if it's possible when this goes out on, on, on the shared document, uh, some YouTube links to my favorite uh, and my inspirational talks. One is by Patsy uh, Rodenberg, who talks about why theater matters to her. And it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful little talk she has. And then there's Ben Zanders, who's a uh, classical music, Western classical music composer, and he talks about how he believes classical music is for everybody. And it's just a beautiful insight into how it's, it's a TED talk of his. And then Ken, Ken Robinson, I will share you some of his talks, which are just beautiful. And RSA Animate is um, a website that animates talks in fascinating ways. So I shall share those links with you, apart from some performance links, which you're welcome to look at if you're interested. Some of my favorite performances, short, short, short little links. And do we have some questions? Oh my goodness. Um, so there's a question here. You mentioned the energy beauty of live theater that is addictive, but it does look difficult to travel it to interior India? What sort of plays were performed? Where were the actors from? Did it encounter any hurdles? Why don't they travel it today? Uh, and then another question is, what sort of rigor and dedication does one need to be a good actor? Well, my, my, my grandparents' traveling theater company, that's what they did. They traveled with their own theater group. So their, their, their performers and their artists were from, from big cities or even international, some of them in Shakespeareana, some of them were picked up in India as well. Um, Prithvi theaters had Indian performers and then they went off to smaller towns and cities. In fact, they went to places which were just incredible uh, to, to, to imagine that, that they, would, they, would, they would visit towns that hardly any urban theater travels to today. It's really sad. Um, I mean, this is a map uh, of just three years of my British uh, grandparents, their travels across the country, and what used to be Pakistan was, I mean, it was India then. This was in the 50s. And they did 800, over 800 shows in three years in these places with multiple shows in some, some, some places, um, the multiple visits. The economy of it just didn't last. So for me, it was a rude shock when I was, because this is the life I wanted to lead. I wanted to be a gypsy. I wanted to travel and, and, and experience India and take theater across the country. But when I was 14, 15, I realized that it wasn't possible anymore because of the econ economy of it, just the economics of it didn't make sense. Um, which is why the companies had to close down. Uh, finally, my grandparents just ended up being two of them. Jeffrey and Laura Kendall uh, traveling across, not then they even went to travel across Europe and England. And when I was 12, I joined 
them for one month. Uh, it was during the summer break and I performed scenes from Shakespeare with them. Uh, and that was the most wonderful experience. Uh, but uh, we drove in the, I was at the back of a little Citron car with their set and a folding chair, which acted as the crown, and I mean, uh, the throne. Uh, uh, and and uh, it was wonderful. Uh, it was theater of economy. It was very, very, um, very minimal, but it was amazing. But um, what is extraordinary about India is that we have such diverse types of theater that happens across the country. We have traditional theater. We have Kuriyatam, which is 2000 years old, contiguous theater that has lasted for 2000 years nonstop and it still exists. Uh, we have um, uh, in Orissa, uh, the most, uh, in, uh, not Orissa, sorry, in Assam, the most incredible uh, theater that, that is performed um, in, on two huge stages in front of 3,000 people in the audience. And these are farmers and these are uh, rural people who pay 50 rupees, 100 rupees tickets. Uh, and it's highly lucrative theater that, that exists uh, across uh, Assam. So there are so many different types of theater. It's actually the urban theater that is struggling because we have no infrastructure and we desperately need support. Uh, so in Maharashtra, there's more support because there is a culture of it. In Bengal, there was some support. It's growing again. Um, but it's, it's just that our, our government systems don't seem to think that theater is really, they think it's a bit of a time pass hobby thing and it's not a serious part of our urban need, our urban expression that we need. And that's what we need to fight for. And we need to claim our space. Um, so one needs a lot of rigor and a lot of, you do have to train as an actor. Uh, it's not something that, I, I mean, it's not the easy thing. I think the big problem that has existed in our country is that we've had a lot of amateur work, which is, which is fine. Um, but we've taken that amateur, um, attitude somehow and that has taken a greater space in our imagination rather than a professional attitude and I think that it just means that a lot of people think oh you can learn your lines and get up on stage and anybody can be an actor whereas no you can't to be an Asiruddin Shah you have to work and work and work and work and that work is not only what you do when you're in rehearsal it's what you do when you're alone it's what you do in your head it's what you do inside you all the time and you fill your senses. And I think it's, it's not a job, it's not a nine to five job being an actor or working in theater. It's a full-time life choice you make. Um, it must have been amazing to get such a progressive education, but since I go to a regular, sometimes boring, sometimes happening school, how can I maintain my individuality? I don't know if I can answer that, but just by being you, uh, yeah, I am totally lucky. I know this. I, uh, I am the most fortunate uh, and privileged you know, person I know uh, because I had the most amazing parents, most amazing grandparents. But um, uh, I think finding a way of being true to you, being true to who you are, uh, you know, and 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 um, no matter. It's interesting because my my husband talks about his time in school, and I talk about my time in school. And in some ways, we were both sort of leaders uh, of our little gang. Sometimes um, I would always be asked to direct things, and I would always, you know like to create, be creative and do new things. He would go in and complain about teachers and get them sacked or slightly dangerous things like that with a group of kids. And my son doesn't want to take that leadership role. That's not him, which is perfectly okay. Uh, I think it would be a problem if we kept pushing him into saying, you've got to, you know, be a leader. That's not who he is. He, 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 so I, I think it is a tussle sometimes because there are other people around you who want you to be something and you want to be somebody else. I think just being honest to that and being true to that, hold on to that, hold on to what it is you, you feel most comfortable in. And I think when you find your element, you know, when you find it and you're doing it, it's when you know everything is just, you're just so happy doing it. It's what gives you the greatest joy. And so really finding that is, is really important. And it could be anything. It could be editing the school magazine and how excited you get about it. Um, 
or it could be about going off on a chess tournament. I don't know what, but uh, that's how you find who you are as an individual and that's what you can be. And sometimes it doesn't matter. You know, you need to be part of the crowd sometimes and that's okay. Um, could you share a little about what managing a theater house is like? What sort of professionals are involved? How is it all managed? You mean Prithvi Theater? Uh, that was a daunting and terrifying experience at the beginning because I was, uh, there's another photograph which I'll share with you uh, at some point later when this goes out, um, of, of me standing on the ground, which is earth, uh, with a, the blueprint, the map uh, of the architectural map of Prithvi Theatre with my mother and the architect, and I'm holding one side of the page. And, and I love that photograph because it actually gave, that was the beginning of my fascination with looking at architectural plans. I love looking at architectural plans and I love architecture because it's, for me, a really interesting art where you create space for people to inhabit. People have to inhabit that space. Uh, and so it's really, really important. It's like theater. Uh, what you do on stage is, is, is you're allowing people to enter into that space. So I think an architect is very close to, to theater in that way. Um, but I was terrified of working at Prithvi and um, I was scared because of the responsibility of it. But when I started, I started with a few ideas. My father said, okay, go start children's workshops, art gallery, re you know, revive the bookshop, the canteen, the cafe, cafe uh, start a little theater company, uh, but find the money. You find the money yourself and then you can run it. So gradually then more and more responsibility came onto my shoulders, but I had no training at all. Uh, I had no experience. I didn't know what it was to really, I knew what it was to work on my own. And so 21 years of working in Prithvi Theatre was an extraordinary experience. I totally loved it, but it was also really difficult. Um, there were times when I would just say, oh my God, take this away. It's just so much. I can't handle it. I don't have the money. I can't find it. The sponsors are not helping. There's no government funding such a responsibility um and it is tough it is very very tough um but at the end of the day when you see the magic happen with people who uh take over the space and it becomes their home whether it's the audience or the theater workers and that's the joy that they have this little oasis to come to which they can call their own and for me that is really beautiful so it has its struggles, but it was worth it. I just, my greatest sorrow was that when Prithvi was in 19, uh, when, when was it, 2003, celebrating its 25th anniversary or 2000, uh, was it, yeah. Um, and for me, that was my deepest sadness was that actually Prithvi was not able to have, after all these years of such success, 25 years, and it was known to be a successful theater venue if it was so successful, why was it not imitated across every single corner of this country? And that's because there was no economic model that made it viable because there is no safety net that our government offers and our government has to offer a safety net. There has to be a safety net for institutions like that, uh, like there are in Western countries. And, um, they need to be other kinds of ways of thinking of the economic model to make it viable. And I hope that in my lifetime that does happen. But that year, the only joy, to the sort of little bit of hope that glimmered in the background was that Ranga Shankara in Bangalore came alive that year. So that was inspired by Prithvi and wonderful and mad Arundhati Nag went out and made it happen. So the birth of that was also what we celebrated our 25th birthday with. So that was one glimmer of hope, but there needs to be, you know, there needs to be 10 Prithvis in Bombay itself and they're not, um, and it's a problem. I'm talking too much. Uh, Ma'am, I like the concept of the element you shared like you, I love arts, but I'm no good at it yet. I don't want to let it go. What are my options? You know, the arts have to have an audience. Uh, Go and find out ways in which you can become 
a discerning audience, whether it is going to the Pune, or I don't know if they still do it. They used to have an amazing um, appreciation course at uh, the Pune archive, or whether it is going to other organizations that give you um, classical art appreciation courses or, or going to festivals, theater festivals or film festivals or music concerts. Um, and trying to find those adas, those places of where you can learn more, where you can appreciate more. Uh, you don't have to be an artist, but you can be a connoisseur. You can be an expert of just experiencing it um, and know what that gives you. And that's really important. We need um, an army of these people everywhere. So that's, that's terrific. Our school had shadow puppetry in a play during Janoon Arts Play, and we even got to do it for the rest of the school. Such hands-on fun impressed me a lot. Where can I find similar activities? Oh no. Uh, well, that was really, that's what Janoon's effort was to bring this exposure and experience to schools, um, which I hope will continue in some form or other. Janoon, unfortunately, we had to close down uh, the COVID-19 reality really uh, made us realize that we couldn't carry on with the struggle anymore. Um, but the dreams are still there. The people are still there. The artists are still there. And we know that when we come across, when we take theater across to different cities and two tier cities and smaller towns across the country, the chances are that children may never see theater again uh, or never experience something like this. And it is a deep sadness, but there are, Theatre festivals that happen, you know, National School of Drama has a festival. There are, there are, there's an organization called um, called Tifli that has a festival in in, in uh, Delhi. Uh, I think just go, keep your ear to the ground and go and visit and experience whenever you can, whenever you can get a chance to see a show or to see a performance. Uh, there are workshops now happening online. In fact, I'll share those details also. Puppetry workshops, in fact, which are happening online. Um, you might want to attend those and see if you can do something sitting, sitting at home, uh, even in these mad times of ours under quarantine. Um, do I continue? Where it's quarter to six, you'll tell me when to stop. Somebody will tell me when to stop um, because I don't have my phone on, so I don't know. Um, do you feel schools kill creativity? You know, some same kind of exam for all of us in class. Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> I don't think it's the school's fault. I think it's our education system's fault. My son uh, moved from, I, I fought with my husband to get my son, uh, we live in Delhi, to get him into an ICSC school rather than a CBSC. And uh, because I did ICSC and it was fantastic. It was, even though we had to learn all these subjects um, and we couldn't really make a choice, uh, only at the end in the eighth standard, you could choose between art and economics and I chose art, which was fabulous. Um, but uh, I, I think that, there was project-based, uh, research-based learning, so much of it. By the time my son went to school, ICSC had changed completely. It had become a mugging curriculum with, with huge amounts of information that has to be just stuffed into his brain. And he hated it. There was no joy. And really the books that were being chosen by the school were pathetic. And this was a really, really, really good school in Delhi. Um, I took him out of that system and uh, put him in IB, uh, which really was extraordinary. It was a huge shift. Uh, within a year, he was very grumpy with me because he missed all his friends. So he never really in front of me claimed that he liked the new school. And one day somebody asked him, you know, how are you doing in your school? This is about a year after he, he'd moved. And he was uh, 10, 11 then. And uh, he said, oh, I'm really liking it and I'm enjoying it. And my friend said, what do you enjoy about it? And I was in a corner listening. I could hear this conversation. And my son turned around and said, you know what I like? I understand what I learn. I mean, that's pretty profound. <laughs> if only we could all understand what we learn. So I think it all starts with the curriculum, but it also starts usually with teacher training 
We have to have teachers who delight in what they do, who delight in igniting your own curiosity, the curiosity and the mind of each individual child and allowing you to flourish and understanding that there are different ways of learning also, you know, not everybody is can learn through lectures, not everybody can learn through reading, not everybody can learn through audio. We all learn differently and uh, we all work differently. I know that when I'm thinking of a new idea, I have to scribble, I have to write it down. Uh, otherwise I feel I'm not, you know, I, I, when I'm thinking of a new, completely new idea, I'm, I'm making lots of notes and scribbling and drawing and, and then I clean it up. Uh, a friend of mine, when she's thinking of a new idea, she's pacing up and down the room like a, caged leopard um, so yeah it's it's i don't think it's the school's fault you know i think uh, the schools are trapped in in a system uh, and you're just lucky when you have a good teacher uh, or a great principal um yeah but education moves beyond schools and it goes on forever and ever and that's that's the joy of it so I'm writing plays and I'm really keen on taking screenplay writing professionally. Any tips for me? Wow, a playwright. Oh my goodness. I hope to God you're performing these plays in school. Um, please, I mean, this is what you must do. You must bully your school to give you time, give you assembly time, give you whatever time you have. Uh, do it even in your class and perform and hear your scripts. Get, get a bunch of school friends together and make sure that you see the life of your play. Um, there used to be, uh, there used to be an inter-school competition run by the British Council in Calcutta. Unfortunately, that's closed down. I hope one day it'll resurrect itself. And it was where children are supposed to, in a school, write their own plays and produce them themselves uh, with very little help by the teachers. And there were wonderful competitions. Um, so keep your ears and eyes open to see if there are any competitions like that that are on. Um, my goodness, just keep writing. Just keep writing and reading and watching theater. How wonderful. That's terrific. Um, in the pandemic times, what can I as a parent do to fuel my kids' energy into productive creative ventures? Uh, well, there are, as I mentioned, there are some workshops. So I will, what I will do is I will, I will share with Takshila Society uh, the creative workshops that I'm aware of that are happening, uh, which are really, really good. Um, a lot, lot of them are hands-on. Uh, some of them may be writing workshops, uh, the puppetry workshops that Anurupa does, who we brought to some of the schools. Um, so I will share with, with you whatever I can. Uh, you know, read to your kids. Uh, don't worry about, you know, the other day, I, my niece and nephew, we were together and, and, and they're eight. And I know my niece had to do some reading. She had to do her reading and that was part of her school job. But I looked at my, 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 my niece and I said, uh, my, no, my niece and nephew's kids, so they are. So my niece and I, and I said to her, do you read to your eight-year-old anymore? And she doesn't. She hasn't read to her for a long time. And we need to read to our children. It doesn't matter how old they are. Even with their 15, 16, it doesn't matter. It's fun. It's really fun. Just sit in a comfortable chair in a comfortable corner on in bed or wherever and just read. Um, watch movies together. Uh, really beautiful classical mu movies. I think, I think that's what we can do. Have conversations. Play games. I don't know. Um, how different is acting in film and theater, both in terms of acting skills and creative satisfaction? Very different. Creative satisfaction, I can't say really, because that depends on the person, the actor, uh, but the skills, the craft is really quite different. Um, in a cinema, you can be like that, right? You can be up close, even like that. On stage, you have to bring in your audience to come in there. So you have to have a whole different skill set to be able to get your audience to focus in on the part of your body or the part of the stage that you want. And, and, and that is really, really an amazing craft. And it can be learned to a certain extent, and it has to be honed through practice and through doing and doing and doing and doing. Um, so it's very, very different. Cinema, you're helped more 
through a lot of the technology and every, everybody else that works with you. But it is also a very different uh, skill and craft that, that needs to be honed. Um, my passion lies in singing, but my parents feel it is not a certain career option. How do I convince them otherwise? Or oh, are they right? There's no way you can convince them otherwise, but they're not necessarily right. Um, you know, if it's your passion, I would say, say really, really go after it. Uh, but, you know, I, there is a beautiful, beautiful singer, and I'll share, I'll share her, her Shruti. I'll share her two links also. You can follow her, Shruti Vishwanathan. Um, she's on um, Facebook. She used to work with us. Uh, she did uh, chemical engineering, I think, in Bits Pilani. Her parents forced her to go ahead because she was brilliant, a uh, brilliant scientific mind. So this is obviously what she had to do. She came and worked with us uh, at Janoon uh, for a while. And then she finally had enough you know, of it all. And she said, now I'm going to go after my true passion. And she's a singer. She's the most beautiful, beautiful singer. She is um, more classical trained. She does a lot of Kabir uh, spiritual singing now. And she's just amazing. Um, and recently, she worked with us at Janoon uh, at, a, at a show we had at the museum in Bombay. Um, but I think you just keep it close to you. You never know when the opportunity may open up where it can become uh, uh, something that can be your profession. It may not, but still hold it close to you. Do not let it go and, and, and build it, learn more, hone it, go out for training, for classes, whatever. Fill yourself with, with all the knowledge and all the experience you possibly can. Don't ever let it go. You might have to do another job, another part of education, but that's okay. Can a hobby turn into a profession? Um, I paint on cups, but is that enough to turn into a business? Because I have zero business acumen. What happens to my passion then? Please suggest something. You know, um, I'm, I'm not the right person to say this because I've never done business as in I've never learned business. But I think that if one were to go and 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 look at all the wonderful, great new initiatives that have happened, whether it's in business or in other spheres, whether it's with wildlife conservation or whether it's in, in, in art or whether it's in engineering, I have a belief, and I think I may be right, that there's a huge percentage in that ingredients of success towards that achievement that lies in basic good common sense. And I think that's something we also need to hone. It's just basic good common sense, you know? So keep your nose to the ground and be real, be connected to your reality around you, be a little street smart, don't live in an ivory tower. And, and maybe one day something as little, what seems as little and trivial as painting paper cups, is that what you do, might turn into something which is an opportunity to do something quite extraordinary. And you don't know what that is. But as long as it gives you joy at the moment and it's not hurting anybody else, and uh, it's something, I think if you sit and try and plan too much now, I think that may be a bit of a problem. Uh, but just go with the flow, and especially now when we have no other distractions because we're all sitting at home with a lot of time on our hands. How important is publicity advertising for promoting plays? Are there designers, writers specifically for this? I mean, can I make a career in this? Making a career in theater in India is not impossible, uh, but it's a huge challenge. And it means that you need to be very, very, very dedicated, very focused. You must know what the reality is out there where you belong, where you live, and also where you'd like to go and be, and what it is you'd like to be part of. You may have bread, but you may not have butter and jam on your bread. And if you're okay with that, then go for it. Um, it's not the most lucrative of businesses. It's not a business, actually. Uh, it's a struggle, but it's, 
it's I think today changing. There is in the last, as I say today, in the last 15 years, uh, more and more young people coming to theater and saying, this is my job. I, this is my primary job. I will do a uh, web series. I will do, which is a great opportunity to work, earn a living now. I will do cinema. I will do, I will not do television because that's seriously bad habit forming and it'll destroy any iota of creativity in you. But I will do advertising maybe. I will do voiceovers. I will do workshops but I will do theater. And there is a way now, and they will also train. So they're going off, they're saving money and they're going off to Italy or going off to Japan. And they're, they're training in different skills, different art forms that they want to, to nurture themselves with. And it's extraordinary. So there are these people and there are younger and younger people coming to theater because I believe there's an audience that is growing. There are people in the, in the audience, there are more and more people who want to put their money there and pay for theater because our lives are taken over by this, by this which is making us more and more disconnected from each other. And theater in this wonderful subliminal way brings you together in this dark house and lets you sit with a group of strangers and feel the same thing. And it's an extraordinary communal collective engagement, which is very, very valuable. And we need it. Everybody needs this. It's important. So go for it, but it's a struggle. Could you please share how can I fight pressure from family and friends and not be bothered by failure? I can't tell you how not to be pressured by family and friends. That's, that's, that's a tough one. Because, I mean, you know, you, you only have the power to change what is in your control. And the only thing that is in your control is you. You cannot control your parents, your family, your friends. You can't change them. You can't change the world. You can just control you. So you have to somewhere be able to switch something inside you that it doesn't bother you or hurt you or damage you. That's really important. But uh, failure, you know, the greatest scientific discoveries would never have happened if people were worried, if Einstein was worried about failure, if, if, if Newton was worried about, oh my God, what if it doesn't happen? They were propelled by the what if. And that what if is what allowed them to venture on that path that had never been trodden on. The what if, and it, there will be failure. There will be mistakes, there will be problems. Say, oops, this didn't work. Got to try again. Maybe that way, or maybe that way, or maybe not at all. You know, and we learn and take it as a learning. Go back and look into yourself and say, okay, what did I learn from that? We all fail. Everybody fails in many different ways, and there's no need to fear it. That's what school should be teaching you, unfortunately. Failure is a taboo word, but it should be a word that is actually celebrated and recognized. Okay, I think that's it, is it? I shall share all the books and everything. Uh, what can we, the, oh, there's another one. Shraddha, closing remarks, please, ma'am. Hang on, I haven't come to that. Okay, what can we, the youth, do to ensure the theater flourishes in cities and compel government to pay attention? Go to the theater, watch plays, buy tickets, take friends, make comments about it and talk to people about it all the time. That's it. It'll trickle down somewhere somebody will hear. Please share the name of the famous book of theatrical performances made by artists to provide us with YouTube links. I will do all that, I promise. Yes. And uh, uh, the, uh, my question is, how should I, as a teacher, appreciate kids when you see they are quite obnoxious, not interested in anything? How do I inspire them and me? Uh, most important, yes, you. You have to be inspired. As I said to the student, I think, who asked the question, you know, you have only, you, you can only control you. You can't control your children. So, you, you, you can't change them. 
you can change you. And so if you are inspired and you walk into the classroom and you're present and you're alert and you're there, the children will notice something. Um, they may try and still be obnoxious. Children are. They are very political creatures and they can be really, really dangerous. But um, I think if you have the belief that there is goodness in everybody and everybody, and you have the belief that you have something to share of you, which is genuinely you, uh, I think there will be other children. It'll be like a contagious little thing that'll go out there and hook kids into paying attention. Um, that's what we do in our workshops. We have teachers' workshops, and um, our teachers' workshops are aimed at actually allowing the teacher to find in themselves their own individual ability to be present in the classroom. And when you're present in the classroom, like you are on stage, you have to have everybody looking at you, and you have to have everybody loving you. And that is what being alive on stage is all about. And that's what being a teacher is all about. Um, I think we're going to now say bye-bye. And thank you very, very, very much for this opportunity. I miss seeing you all and being in the same space with you. But I hope one day we get to meet. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.